All right, so um, as we begin uh, this week, uh, I just wanted to kind of bring forth the schedule a little bit because at this time of the year, we have to be very mindful of the stuff that's coming out, okay, or the stuff that's coming before us. Uh, oh, good morning, by the way. I forgot to say good morning. How's everyone doing? Surviving? Everyone surviving the smoke? Okay. Please take care of yourselves. Honestly, take care of yourselves. The air quality is very, 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 very poor. Um, try to find yourselves inside as much as you can. This is one of those things where, you know, you can't see the harm that you're doing to yourselves, uh, but there's, the air quality is bad. And it's going to get worse as we go throughout the day. What it is now is not what it's going to be at 3 or 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, it gets worse as we go through the day. So please make sure you're taking care of yourselves, honestly, okay? Uh, especially, yeah, wear masks, you know? I, mean, I don't know if, uh, if there's any over in the nurse's office anymore. I think they were handing out some for a period of time. Uh, I know that there are a lot of fire stations are handing out masks. I know the fire stations that are immediately surrounding my house have all run out of masks to wear. So it really is a good idea if you can. Um, walk quickly to and from, you know, point A to point B if you're going in and out of buildings. Um, as far as we know, classes are not going to be canceled uh, in, the, in, the, in the short term. I can't speak to anything that's happening much past today or tomorrow. I know Sac State closed down again today. Uh, we're, you know, we're going to be uh, obviously business as usual for us around here. Uh, I think the larger point here is that the air quality is going to be different in the different regions within Sacramento. So just be aware of it. It is something that we need to be conscious of. In addition, uh, you know, if you have the capacity to support the, uh, you know, the victims of the fire up in Paradise in the greater Chico area, I uh, definitely look to do that. Uh, there's a lot of folks up there that need a tremendous amount of support and love. Um, so if you have that capacity, you know, help out in whatever way that you can. I think we all need to kind of help manage the situation. We don't have to look too far to find people that are impacted by uh, this disaster inside of our local community. You know, their Chico is kind of a neighbor to us. Um, so, you know, support as much as you can. You know, even something as, as small as a 12 pack of water, you know, left at a fire station is something that can be helpful. Okay. Um, one thing, and this is just, it boils my blood to hear this, the scammers are already trying to take advantage of these, of these fires, which is absolutely remarkable to me, right? And they're setting up fake GoFundMe pages and fake charities trying to get as much, you know, you know, uh, you know relief, you know, money for them. And, you know, please give to reputable charities, okay, and organizations that you know and trust. Just don't do, you know, some Joe Bob down the street who says he's going to Chico to help out the firefighters. Don't trust an individual like that, uh, especially if you don't know this person personally because it's happening. Yeah, so... Uh, please support as much as you can. There's a lot of folks out there that need our love and attention right now. To bring it a little bit more direct uh, to the impact in the California Community Colleges, our sister school, Butte College, um, is announced over the weekend that, uh, that 138 faculty members had lost their homes of a Butte College, which is just absolutely stunning. Okay, that's, that's a majority of their faculty. Butte College is not a tremendous school. And to think that you know, a majority of their faculty are without homes is, is quite staggering. So... Um, you know, keep those people in their thoughts and prayers. Yeah. I donated some, uh, some money today. Great. To, you know, cost. Um, you know, Goodwill is giving out free uh, stuff if you are affected by fire. If you go for the 90, yeah. you can go to any Goodwill and they'll give you like, shampoo Ugh. and things like that. That's fantastic. And then like, any pet supplies. Mm -hmm. like, I know Chico Airport um, has a shelter for animals. And nice. Awesome, awesome. Uh, be aware of it. You know, I, I think far too often some of these disasters aren't really at our doorstep. Well, this one certainly is, okay? So um, support, help in whatever capacity that you can. There's a lot of folks out there that need it right now. And it couldn't come at a worse time of year right before the holidays as well. Um, what kind of struck home for me is, you know, you, you hear people, you know, losing their homes, which is horrible. But when you think of like an entire city, of erased off the face of the planet because of the fire. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a person's way of life at that moment, right? Uh, and that's a, that's a tough, tough challenge to crawl out of. So support them, love them, you know, do whatever you can do to help the situation because there's a lot of folks that need some help. Okay? All right. 
Let's get back to our stuff. Um, we have a bunch of stuff that's going on uh, here locally over the next couple of days, and I want you guys to be aware of some of these really important calendar milestones. Um, registration for the spring semester starts next week. Whoa, crazy, right? Um, yeah. Well, I wish I could join you guys for the spring, but I'll be working on out here. All right. Well, great. Moving on to the bigger and better, I hope. So if you need some suggestions, you need some advice on what classes you need to take, uh, the, you know, the, the full-time faculty in our department are having some open advising days. We were going to have a table outside, <laughs> but clearly that table has now moved inside. Uh, so it's going to be down in the design lab. There's a little table right off to the right of the entryway in the design lab. So if you have a question, you need some help figuring out which classes you need to take in the spring, come find us. Uh, the schedule is posted here on the board, and I think that is the need advice poster on the wall. So if you, uh, if you have some questions, I mean, obviously you guys get access to me whenever you want, but if you want to come talk with me in the lab, I'll be there tomorrow from 11 to 1. Um, and there's be folks in there today and also on Friday as well in preparation for registration beginning next week. Also, uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Okay, it's next week. Does anyone have any big Thanksgiving plans? I'm cooking. You're cooking? I hope it goes well, yeah. Okay, great. Well, ho hopefully that hopefully everyone can some take some time and uh, empty the cup, stop, decompress. Honestly, if you have the capacity, try to find an opportunity to relax and just kind of do something not school related for a period of time. Uh, it's important that we have these opportunities to just kind of chill and relax and decompress because after we come back from Thanksgiving, it's going to get real hard. Okay, and it's going to get really intense, really fast. Okay, so let's just look at the schedule for a second because. I think this is going to be eye-opening because <laughs> it was for me. Okay, so next week is Thanksgiving. Campus is going to be closed from the 22nd all the way to the 25th, the entire campus, all the labs and what have you. Okay, and then when we come back on the 26th, let's just take a look at it here real fast. We'll flip the calendar into December. Dun, da, da, da. Here is that 26th, November 26th, and you can see that finals begin on the 14th. So once we return from our Thanksgiving break, we basically have what, one, one, two, three and a half weeks or so before, before we wrap up. And one of those weeks is finals. Okay, yeah. That's fine. Okay, that's no problem at all. No problemo. Uh, the final project for this class is gonna be due on the 20th. Okay, and we're gonna start building our final project today today because we don't have enough time or a, a lot of time left in the semester to, uh, to di di dilly daddle with other ideas. We have to be a little bit more direct on the production of our final project. Uh, so today we're going to spend our time talking about animatics and we're going to talk about cinematography. If you go back to the beginning of the semester I said at times we're going to be animators, at other times we're going to be riggers, other times we're going to be cinematographers. Well today is that cinematography day and then we're going to have another cinematography day kind of clo uh, closer to uh, maybe like the 5th or the 12th, I haven't quite figured which day it is going to be yet, where he's talk all about rendering, okay? And I, we're going to do a deep dive on how the motor rendering engine is influencing our ability to draw some really great pictures, okay? We'll talk about some compositing, some multi-pass rendering ideas that will help you quickly get through this rendering stage, or quickly, in finger quotes, because it's never fast, is it not? Yeah. It's always slow, and it's always painful. Um, so today we're going to talk about cinematography because it's important that we start looking at these, these, uh, these photography ideas as we start to create an animatic. And that's going to be our, our next big assignment for this project is an animatic. And I'm going to force you guys to make an animatic, right? Because uh, we're going to be doing a 30 second short film, okay? 30 seconds, okay? So we have to prototype what this entire thing looks like in an animatic first. Now we've spent some time talking about animatics before. If you go way back, it seems like such a long time ago, right? The Alien Invasion Project, we did a small animatic. Now what were you guys able to extrapolate from that, from that assignment and from that process of creating an animatic? So we talked about camera paths a little bit, yep. Some simple constraints, yep, absolutely. And when it comes... Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when it comes to the context of creating an animatic, what do you guys remember? What was the purpose behind an animatic? Shots. Shots, yeah. right? Timing. Timing, absolutely. Speed. Understanding the visual language of your film. 
right? In every sense, it's our first draft. It's the first conceptualization. I think I may have just invented a word there, uh, which I'm fine about, uh, of, of our narrative, of our film itself. We have to go through this process. We're, we're going to have an idea stored in our brain, but we need to spend some time crafting and molding and shaping that idea into a narrative that's truly representative, okay? And this is the important part about the filmmaking process is that we need to give ourselves an opportunity to change things, especially in the context of computer animation. The labor that's required for our type of cinematography is intense, right? So we want to be able to give ourselves a chance to change our minds, to look at things from a different perspective, just to experiment and most importantly explore an idea in its smallest moving parts and pieces. And that's really what the animatic serves, is that important part of uh, the filmmaking process, that exploratory part. Shoot, some directors, they just show up on set, right? Have you ever wondered why some, you know, at times you know, films just take an inordinate, in, an inordinate amount of time? Yeah, sometimes they're just exploring ideas. They don't have a plan, right? They have loose kind of understandings of what the scene requires, but then sometimes the director just shows up on set with his lights, his cameras, his actors, and he says, okay, let's figure out what this is going to look like, right? And then he starts putting it together, kind of like a puzzle, right? Uh, he or she will look at the scene and look at, at the staging of the actors and start to say, hmm, is this the best way to present this idea, right? Can I present it in a different way that's going to be more impactful? That's a question that sometimes we don't have an answer to until we're in the moment, right? Dancers do this. My wife's a dancer. Well, she used to be a dancer before, before we started having kids. And yeah, yeah. And uh, so I, huh? She did a lot of jazz, a lot of jazz and a lot of hip-hop dancing. So all the things that I'm, I, I can't dance, right? Like I, uh, she's the dancer, she's a little bit country, I'm a little bit rock and roll, right? She does all the dancing and I go, <laughs> you know, I just, I stand on the sides and claps while she's the dancer, right? Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I, I appreciated from being exposed to her art and her craft is how uh, choreographers approach the creation of their artwork. Because dance is very, very similar to film in the sense that we're trying to still tell a story in movement, right? And a choreographer often just comes with the music and maybe some loose ideas, kind of like how we, how, how we start our process, right? And then when they get the dancers on the stage, they start putting these, these, uh, these pieces together and they explore how this entire thing comes together as, an, as a whole. They make changes along the way. And they know that this is not linear, and it's organic, okay? The animatic stage for us kind of represents uh, that moment for us. This is not linear, okay? There are no, you know, A to Z prescriptions on how to come to this conclusion, right? We have to explore it, okay? There are some guidelines, however, that I want to talk about today when it comes to the construction of shots that are going to be very helpful in you crafting a visual narrative that's understood by our audience, okay? Filmmaking is this weird beast, especially when it comes to computer animation, because on, on one hand, it's very, very personal, because we're creating these characters, these scenes, and of course, their movements. But you also have to re be reminded, almost at every, state, every moment of this, of how our audience is understanding and deciphering all of these puzzles that we're presenting to them. Okay, so we got to keep in mind our audience. Now, I found a really great resource for you guys that I've linked over in Canvas. Let's just go check it out real fast that I think is going to be really super impactful and helpful in your construction of your animatic this time. All right, so let's just go over into, into Canvas real fast. As you can see, all of my spring stuff just got activated. Welcome to the back end of D2L. If you guys ever find, or Canvas, if you guys ever find uh, uh, Canvas frustrating, yeah, okay. Look what we have to deal with. This is fun, is it not? All right. Okay. So if you go into the week 12 section on Canvas, I've, I've linked a really great article that I, um, that I think just kind of buttons up a lot of really fantastic ideas. So it's this one, Tips to Improve Your Camera Work. I can't recommend this one enough, okay? 
It's a good, good article, um, all about camera placement and the purpose of these camera placements. And there's some ideas. I'm not going to go through all of this stuff, but uh, I do want to talk about some staging ideas that's going to help you craft a more impactful visual narrative for your shots. Okay. So what we're going to do is that we're going to jump back over into Moto real fast and build a simple little scene. Bum, bum, bum. And I'm in a crazy mood today, so I think what I'm going to use, I need some characters. The chicken's going to happen today. I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling the chicken. I got to remember where the chicken lives. Okay, the cartoon chicken is going to be the primary character of my scene, and as will, uh, as will this hippopotamus, which is ginormous in comparison to the chicken. Okay, so we're going to have the hippo and the chicken having a conversation uh, inside, inside of our little short film here. So it's going to be a giant chicken, and that's okay. Okay, so these are going to be our two characters. Now, we're going to look at some cinematography ideas that we should follow to ensure that we're capturing uh, their conversation correctly. Okay, how we place and where we place our camera is going to have a direct impact on our audience's under, uh, ability to understand what it is that we're showing them, right? So let's make a very small little set and scene here. I'm going to go to my empty mesh item and start off the day. Let's just do this. I'm going to create the world's simplest set. Something like that. I'm going to center it inside of my scene. And then, excuse me for a second while I just do some house cleaning here. I'm going to turn off the visibility of a couple ideas. There we go. So we just get down to our simple scene. And then I'm just going to make some walls with edge extend. There we go. Now, I can't recommend enough that we, rem that, uh, that we be aware that this is an illusion. Filmmaking is false. There's nothing real about films, okay? It's a fabrication of reality. It really is. Um, case in point, have you guys ever seen some of those old spaghetti westerns from the 60s and 70s, right? So the Clint Eastwood style movies, right? Great, great example of how false this entire art form is. You go into, you see Clint Eastwood going into the wild, wild west, right? Into the old wild, wild west town. And you see the fronts of all the buildings. Do they actually create all the buildings as sets? No, they just create the fronts, or they just create what the camera sees. They're not actual real buildings, right? And they're often manipulations of reality to ensure that the characters are being emphasized. A great example of this is also in these spaghetti westerns. They made the doors, okay, smaller. Why? Why would you make the doors smaller? Perspective a little bit. Specifically, they made the doors smaller so that the, the heroes, when walking out of the doors, would look like giants, right? They look huge when, in fact, they're, you know, just my size, right? Tom Cruise is the great example. Tom Cruise is not a very big man, right? He's like my size. He's like five foot, five foot seven. He and I would probably be on the exact same wavelength. But you look at the way that they capture his persona and his character in camera, and he looks like this action hero that's seven feet tall that can, you know, jump over buildings and what have you, right? It's amazing that Tom Cruise can still do all these action films. He's getting kind of old. Does anyone know how, Tom, how old Tom Cruise is? Yeah, I think he's in the mid to late 50s, which is just absolutely mind-boggling. Same with Harrison Ford. I mean, there's a reason they killed off Harrison Ford, uh, you know, Han Solo. And, 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 uh, he was getting too old, man. He couldn't be Han Solo anymore. And now they want to do another Indiana Jones film? They do. What? What? They better hurry up, right? They better hurry up because he, <laughs> he's not going to be. It's going to be Indiana Jones and the search for the Golden Walker here in a minute, right? <laughs> Because it's he's getting old. He's in his late seventies, which is amazing, right? Exactly. All right. Anyways, so this is all fake. This is all fake. We can play with inside this illusion, and I encourage you to play with inside this illusion. Let's bring it back to computer graphics. This kind of speaks quite wonderfully to um, to us. Now, let's see if I can get YouTube to pull my live stream because I want to go to YouTube. This is going to be YouTube inception moment here. Yeah, okay. Classic moment from Toy Story 1, right? 
a moment that we all know and love very, very closely. It's a great sequence with the army men, okay? Now I'm going to fast forward a little bit because specifically this speaks quite directly to the illusion of computer graphics, okay? So would anyone remember what's about to happen? Poof, poof. They're going to go see with toys, okay? Now these series of shots here is quite iconic of the illusion of computer graphics, okay? Check it out. Of course, we have two pair jumpers. Pair jumpers. They're they're uh, they're jumping over their, the the uh, uh, the floorboards here. Now watch very carefully this sequence because it's a great shot right here. Let's make it nice and big so everyone can see it. Okay. So as the army men come on in, as the army men jump over, watch very specifically the camera movement. Okay. What happens to our army guys in that moment? They disappear, right? Okay. And then the next time we see them, poof, poof. Okay. Their parachutes come out. Okay. Singular shot. But I saw an interview with the, uh, uh, with the directors of the film. They said this is actually four different character models, right? Or two different sets, if you will. Okay. So they have one set here where the parachutes are all wrapped up on their back, right? They didn't have the technology or the budget or the resources to actually unfold the parachutes and have them unwrap from their, from their rubber banded uh, you know, backpacks. So what they created right there is a cut point. So if you imagine on the, if I was to do a profile shot of the balcony, right? So here's the, the banisters. This is the platform where the army guys are jumping off, and they're jumping off down to the floor, right? So, woo, we're going to land down here, okay? So what they did, and this is just a brilliant solution to a very complex problem, is they made a little cutout right underneath the balcony, okay? The audience never sees the cutout in the balcony. So as the first, uh, the first set jumps, they actually jump like this, okay? And as the first set that is coming into the little cubby, the second set is jumping out, and then when the camera picks them back up, so they swap the models, right? They swap the models. It's all an illusion, right? We're free to do solutions or to create solutions like this to our very complex problems. We don't have to create, you know, a cloth simulation and figure out how to unfold all the, the parachutes. Sometimes the easy solution is to swap the models in a fashion that, it, that stops um, that stops our audience from seeing them, okay? We are tricksters, okay? We really are. And we're free to start, we're free to fool our audience as much as we like. All right, let's go back, uh, back over here in Moto and continue to craft my little tricky scene. So we don't have to build everything. We just have to build what the audience is going to see. And we start breaking it down into a whole series of shots. That freedom to move and craft the illusion starts to increase quite directly. So here's what we're going to do. I'm actually going to use edge slice and just slice. There we go. Slice that polygon in half. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing once more. Here's a great little moto modeling trick, by the way. Um, this is a good one. So if you ever want to slice, using edge slice, or loop slice for that matter, it works both ways. If you want to slice perfectly in the center of polygons, I'll hold on the control key. Boy, we're rocking edge slice. It's pretty cool. So I just fired off the edge slice tool. I'm holding down the control key. Now, it doesn't matter where I click. Notice that my cursor is way up here. It's automatically going to put that, that slice point in the middle if I hold down the control key. So it's a fa fast way just to get some easy slices going on. Okay, great trick. I use that all the time. It's one of my favorite features. Works with uh, loop slice as well. Or excuse me, let me speak a little bit more directly. It doesn't work with loop slice. It works with add loop. Okay, which is different than loop slice. Okay. So I can do add loop, and then I click in the center, and it adds a loop in there. Okay. All right. So here's going to be my silly little scene. Now, I'm a big believer that we should get this into camera as fast as we can. When we're creating our animatics and we're creating the shots for our scene, we need to see quite instantly what the camera is going to see and use that viewfinder to lead our entire decision-making process. Okay? 
The OpenGL viewport is not communicative, okay, of what the audience is going to see. So I'm going to subdivide this viewport and let's put this in to the camera, okay? And now I'm going to start looking at my environment from what my camera sees. Because what is the one component that's absent in the OpenGL viewport? What does this camera viewfinder ultimately give us that the OpenGL viewport does not? Framing, absolutely. Yep, the framing is important. Being able to see the boundaries of our, of our composition frame is super critical. What else? To a certain degree. You're in the ballpark. We can get a little bit more, a little closer to its lighting. Okay. But most importantly, it's the camera lens and an understanding how the focal length of our camera lens is impacting uh, what the audience sees in the shots themselves. Okay. That's completely absent over here. And shoot, let's make my background a little bit more engaging than what I have here, just to give us some points of reference. I think I'm just going to throw in some presets real fast to populate my scene. And let's do this. Let's go into, um, I am shopping right now. I think if I remember correctly, we could put a bathroom in here. No, we're not going to put a bathroom in here. Ah, doors. This is what I was looking for. Let's do this. Whoops, I'm in edges, didn't mean to be in edges. Let's try that again. Maybe we have a whole series of doors inside of our scene, something like that. That's awesome. There's also, oh yes, how about a reindeer hide? Please don't crash. Does anyone know the keyboard shortcut with the transform? Yeah, control shift. And then you drag on the transform handles and it's going to drag out a copy. Yeah, that's a cool one, right? Yeah, so what it made, and that has everything to do with the duplication mode of the transform tool, it's set to instance at the moment. So if I just did duplicate it, just make a traditional item copy. Okay. Yep. Yes, my reindeer hide is awesome. It's not awesome. It's pretty horrible. But that's not actually what I was going for. I thought there was street lights in here. These are cool. Sconces. Okay, I'm getting, I'm shopping way too much here. This is good. We'll just leave it. Something, something simple like this. All right, so, okay, there's my stupid little scene. Now I want to have a conversation between my two characters inside of this scene. So uh, it's critical that we get our scene into a camera lens as fast as possible. And then we start crafting the illusion around what our audience is going to see. Because, you know, as you guys know, they're not going to see the stuff in the OpenGL viewport. They're never going to see the illusion. They're only ever, 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 ever going to see this. Right? So this now becomes the most important part of our entire production pipeline. I really don't care about the details of my three-dimensional scene anymore. I am crafting a picture now. Okay? Put my cinematographer hat on. Okay? So there's a couple things in here that we want to experiment and explore. The first is focal length on our camera lens. Okay? And uh, let's do this. Let's get my little hippopotamus out of the way. Don't need him for the time being. I'll come back to you in a second. And let's look primarily at our chicken. I want to frame him up. Just kind of do a nice little close-up shot here. Okay. Shoot, let's get crazy. Why not? Let's go into inactive meshes and we'll shade them the same style as our active mesh. That way everything is hunky-dory. I'm also going to turn off the visibility of my wireframes. Go. Shoot, let's really get crazy. Let's go into the advanced viewport model, or advanced, uh, advanced viewport. 
There we go. Now we're actually getting some real-time shadows and lights and stuff, which is kind of cool. This is absolutely going to crash Moto, but we'll see how far we go, right? Okay. So if you look very carefully, I put those doors in the background for a very defined reason, because I want you to pay very close attention to how the background is going to change when we start changing the focal length of our camera, right? Now, it's very easy to change the lens, if you will, on your camera. It's a camera property. Of course, it's way down here under camera effects. Excuse me, it's under camera view, not camera effects. And it's right there at the focal length, OK? Now, if you were a classic cinematographer, if you were to have a real camera sitting here in front of you, the focal length of your camera is something that cinematographers spend a tremendous amount of time studying and understanding. Because this, in every sense, is going to shape our audience's understanding of the, of the image itself. Here's the big picture idea, and this is how I kind of manage this, because there's a lot of numbers in here, and I'm not a math guy, right? The smaller the focal length, the wider angle lens you're going to have on your camera. So I think of like big background versus small background, OK? So the if you have a wide angle lens, a lens the background is going to be pretty big. It's not going to be a, 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 you know, kind of almost like a character inside of your scene itself, OK? Uh, and then the higher the number, the more telephoto the lens is going to be, right? And the smaller the background is going to be. Now the audience, the character, you know, the focal point of the, of the frame itself, the, you know, it's going to shift ever so slightly, but it's really the backgrounds that are the most, the most apparent and the most visibly seen. So let's just take a look at it here real fast. And I want you, let me see, yeah, okay. I want you to look very carefully, and let's just intentionally make a bad camera shot here. Okay, so at 50 millimeters, I want you to look at these doors way off in the background. Okay, shoot, let's just do this. Let's just render a shot real fast. Or maybe not real fast. All right, we're just going to wait for a second while this uh, decides to crash on me. I knew I should have gone over the advanced viewport. <laughs> I was fueled by my misplaced sense of confidence. I should have just stayed in the default okay. viewport. There we go. I really want to get computers with, with high-end graphics cards in here. That would be fantastic, would it not? Like Say again? Nice. <clears throat> yeah, that's the thing, right? That's the thing. Our little community college is probably not going to afford uh, or be willing to buy. You know how hard I had to fight every three years to get these iMacs, right? Yeah, it's pretty intense. And really, we're squabbling over $150 per unit. That's it, right? When it comes right down to it, it's, anyways, I'll, I'm not going to bring you guys into this. <laughs> All right, so here's, here's my picture uh, at 50 millimeters. Look at the background, OK? Look at the role that these doors have. They're quite big. They're almost a character inside the scene itself. Now, once we start, once we start changing this, it's going to shift ever so slightly. Our understanding of the background is going uh, uh, to get warped. So if we go like 20 millimeters, OK? Now look at it. So there's, there's 50. Here's 20. If I was to get the same composition, roughly, much wider angle. Let's do it again. Let's render again. I should have turned the advanced viewport off. But look how much further those doors appear way in the background. Okay. The other thing that we're starting to fight here no, yeah, it's really thinking about it still. The other thing that we're starting to fight here is distortion, okay? Because as we increase the focal length, okay, and go wider and wider and wider, okay, we're starting to get barrel distortion, okay? The lens is trying to capture almost the entire, you know, a field of view that's pretty intense, right? And in order for us to, in order for the lens to capture that kind of perspective, it tends to optically distort the straight lines, okay? which can be weird, often very strange. Uh, but some people love it. 
Uh, there was a style for a while. I'm not exactly a hip hop guy, but I know like all the hip hop music videos had like this fisheye lens effect, right? Where it kind of looked like you were in a globe. It was cool. It was stylistic for the time period. I'm not sure if, if that's a thing anymore. Um, it's from, from the 90s, yeah. It goes to show you the last time I checked in with pop culture was in the 90s, right? <laughs> My wife gives me a tremendous amount of grief about that because you know, we just came, you know, over the weekend, we traveled up to uh, Northern California, up to Eureka. And uh, she was, you know, everyone in my car fell asleep for the first half of the ride. And I was happy just sitting there in absolute silence for, you know, a couple hours. She's like, how can you do that? How can you just drive in absolute well, I'm entertained by my own thoughts. I don't need music and things to stimulate me. Okay, so here is the 20 millimeter, right? So if we just do a simple comparison between the two, it's pretty stark. Okay. Yeah. Come on, Moto. You're going to work today. Yeah, so there's the 50. There's the 20, okay? Look at the role of the background. Very, very similar compositions, but as we get wider and wider in our, our camera lens, that background feels bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're almost to the point, if I was just to shift my camera's view ever so slightly, I'd almost see that third door. You can actually start to see the corner of the room. It's now becoming a player, an aspect of the actual uh, picture that we're taking itself. Now let's do one more. We're going to do the inverse of this, and we're going to do a telephoto. Okay, we're going to really increase. We're really going to increase uh, the focal length. Then I'll do something that's kind of a classic one, and I'll do 200 millimeters. Okay. Now look at the composition. Okay, very similar. Okay, let's do one more render. Oops. Sorry, hit the wrong button. Maybe. I don't know why it's thinking about it. It's thinking hard today. It's all the smoke. Even the computers are like, guys, I'm done. You know? Right? Out there in the cinematography world, when you start getting to focal lengths of 200, 250, this is often referred to as long lenses, okay, because they're super telephoto. This is when, you know, someone could be, you know, in land park, okay, taking a picture of me waving, yeah, out in front of the classroom, right? Super telephoto, it magnifies and compresses the image quite, quite directly. And I want you to come back to that word compress, okay, because look at it now. So here's the 50. Here's the 20, and then here's almost the exact same composition, but at a 200 millimeter lens, okay? See how it feels like the background is right on top of our object again, okay? It almost feels like the door is two inches away from the back of our chicken's head, right? The higher, the higher focal lengths are going to compress your scene, okay? Oftentimes, how, how we in the cinematography world resolve this compression is through depth of field, right? So this is another camera term for the day. What is depth of field? You guys know it. You guys have seen it. We may not be aware of the actual terminology behind it. What is depth of field? How blurred the background is. It's the blurred back, uh, background, okay? Now, we can do that easily here in Moto. It's a camera effect. We just have to enable it. Like motion blur, though, <laughs> this is going to increase your render times pretty significantly, but we can do it, and the result can be quite good. Okay, So let me show you how to turn on this depth of field. This is something that we want to be strategic in using. We're not going to want to use it on every shot, but there are some shots, and this is a really great example uh, of where we would want to do it. Uh, it really comes and plays direct big, huge dividends quite wonderfully. Okay. So, um, <laughs> thank you, Melissa. Melissa just emailed me. You guys know Melissa. She's living back. She's not here right now because of the smoke. And she just uh, emailed me on uh, the live stream making fun of what I'm saying. So, thank you, Melissa, <laughs> from home. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, anyways. 
All right, um, so let's get back to it. So I'm still on my camera, and let's start playing around with depth of field. Now, this is a camera effect, so we're not going to see its impact inside the OpenGL V ports. We're only, only, only ever going to see it actually in render or in the preview render. Okay. So if I just bring open good old preview here, let's start the preview engine. I'm just chugging along a little bit here today. Actually, I know why it's chugging along. I think the chicken has some subsurface scattering going on in the material that's associated with its, uh, with its body. Yeah, see how it's kind of pinkish? I'm going to turn that off. That's going to greatly increase. Let's turn off the reindeer hide. We don't need that. And uh, yeah, we're going to go into the body material and just turn off all of its subsurface scattering. We don't need that. Oh, yeah, it's at 100%. Yeah, don't need that. That's going to help. Probably the beak has some too. Yep. Awesome. This is going to make our render times go a whole lot faster as well. What about the eye? Yeah, even though eyeball had a little bit. Okay, that's going to go faster. Teeth. There better not be any sub. There is subsurface scattering on the teeth. Golly, whoever did this did a really great job. Okay. Uh, and this is honestly a good, a good project. All right, so let's go into our camera effects. I still got my render camera selected. And um, here it is. Here's depth of field. Now, last week we talked a little bit about motion blur for our domino rally. Uh, depth of field is going to start to uh, simulate that blurred background. So let's just turn it on. And this is what you get. Isn't that wonderful? This is such a wonderful, pretty picture, right? So this is actually doing exactly what we want it to do. OK? Um, however, we haven't told the computer which focal plane to register. Now, you guys have seen this. Have you ever worked with a camera? Our cell phone cameras kind of kind of do it to a certain degree. But if you played around with a DSLR or point and click camera, figuring out where inside of the, view, uh, inside of the, the image to focus, that's establishing the focal plane. Are we having the camera focus all of its internal lens mechanisms like a foot from the camera or like eight feet from the camera? Okay, We have to do the exact same thing here inside of Moto. Now, some of you guys may have seen this, okay? Okay, I'm over here inside of my OpenGL viewport. I'm going to see if I can do eight things at once, okay? So I want to turn on the visibility of my cameras. There we go. So now, where is it? There it is. So there is my camera. And Moto actually gives you a really good, solid, kind of dotted line. I know it's kind of hard to see. But that little dotted line, let's see if I can get it to a point where you can see it. Yeah, that little dotted line is a great representation of your focal length on your, on, on your camera, right? So pay attention. There's these small little subtle cues that will help you. In addition, if I was to hit the Y key, Y is in Yankee, okay? Of course, we're going to hit the item transforms, move, rotate, and scale. But what's that little blue square at the end of that purple line? This is the focal plane. This is where your camera is focusing inside the scene. Okay, So this is one additional thing that we have to set. There's a couple ways that we can go about doing this. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to drag this, this little blue dot. And I'm going to put it right there on my chicken's face. And now you can see quite wonderfully that my chicken is in focus. And my door in the background is starting to blur out a little bit. Okay, It's pretty cool. So it's actually a property. It's a channel that we can animate. Okay, If you look very carefully, really what we're animating here is the focus distance. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's called pulling focus. And this is something that cinematographers actually struggle with. It's one of the hardest things. Okay, Imagine you're on a movie set and you're filming um, Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. He's walking from the back of the scene to the front of the scene. Of course, you have the, uh, you know, the, the cinematographer that's running the camera, but then the first AC, the first assistant camera person, is going to be pulling focus, physically focusing the camera lens to accommodate that shift in staging okay, as the actor walks from the back to the front. We have to do the same thing. Yep. It's a challenge. Actually, it's my understanding that if you are a expert focus puller, you will never be without work in Hollywood because it is an art form, believe it or not, to gauge, to physically, instantaneously figure out how far an actor is away from the camera lens and then to focus 
you know, as they move around the scene. That's, uh, that's, not, that's not a small challenge. Okay, so, so we have to do, oops, excuse me. I broke it. I changed my focus distance. Oops, let me go back in time. There we go. Uh, so we, there's, a, there's two things that we have to, to turn on or to really kind of focus on, no pun intended, uh, when trying to establish depth of field, right? We have to turn it on, right? And we have to establish our focal plane, our focal distance. Now we can increase and decrease how blurred the background is by changing the f-stop, okay? Now the f-stop, if you're used to working with cameras, the f-stop is, is what? It's the aperture, but what's the aperture? That's a fancy photography term. Of the, uh, of the lens, Bingo, it's the opening of the lens, right? Because the lens is actually a whole series of component pieces that are all working together to feed light onto the sensor very specifically, right? At the back of the lens, there's an aperture, and that aperture can be, you know, completely, you know, almost completely shut, or it can be wide open. The larger the aperture, the more light is going to go into the, uh, into the sensor itself. Uh, the more light that hits the sensor, the, in, the higher our, you know, the, the more blurry our backgrounds are going to be, okay? So the lower this number, the more open our aperture is going to be, right? So if you wanted a super blurred background, an f-stop of like 1.2 is going to really blur the background, okay? We're at 4. It's a good place to begin. You saw what the illusion was a second ago. Let's, uh, so there it is. Look at, look at the door. Pretty blurred, okay? Let's put this to 1.2. Oops, not 102. Ooh, look at that. Now it's super blurry. Super blurry. And we're starting to lose kind of definition of those objects in the background. Okay. Um, this is how we get our images to look a little bit more photographic by adding depth of field and by experimenting around these different, uh, different focal points. Okay. Um, putting a different lens on your camera is going to give you a much larger read, or excuse me, a much different read on the much larger scene as a whole. Okay? This is something to experiment with. Okay? Here's some tips and tricks when figuring out camera composition. I'm going to turn off my depth of field because okay? it just takes up a lot of memory, okay? a, lot of, a lot of processor power. Here's some tips and tricks. The reason my door was so blurred. Let's just turn it on just for one more second. So an f-stop of 1.2. Look how blurred that door is in the background. It's pretty intense, okay? Now the reason it's blurred as much as it, as it is is because it's pretty far away from my actor, from the focal point of my image itself. Let's experiment, and this is the cool thing about computer graphics, is that we can shift these things around pretty quickly and see how they impact our scene itself. Okay, I'm gonna pause, uh, I'm gonna pause the renderer. Do you guys know you can do that in the preview? Yeah, this, this is, so just finish giving me a preview. I can also just pause it, and now I won't update until I hit that button again, okay? Now, let's watch what happens when I start to shift my scene around a little bit. And uh, I'm not going to move my actors. I'm going to try really, really hard to move everything but my actors. Let's watch what happens when I start moving yeah, now the illusion is broken pretty directly. <laughs> Look at, the, the chicken is the size of the door. It's bigger than a door right now, which is fun. Okay, but let's see what the illusion is now. It's still blurred, but it's definitely not blurred as much, okay? Here's my suggestion when crafting these scenes. Make them big, okay? Don't make small little boxes. Make them gigantic boxes, okay? Give yourselves a lot of room with inside of your three-dimensional space uh, to place your actors and to place your cameras, okay? You're going to find that very small sets are going to restrict very directly your ability to craft some good shots. You're going to get in the way, okay? Uh, you'll see this here uh, directly in a minute when we start placing multiple cameras within inside the scene and start animating them and start crafting a small little narrative between our chicken and our hippopotamus, okay? So give yourself some big, so, some, uh, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, um, can you just, can you just uh, expand the focal plane all the way if you want? Is that going to throw in the, um, the focal point complication? Let's check it out. Okay. So this is the way to think of it. 
when, it, when, when you're dealing with real camera effects, the f-stop, the aperture, it's going to be focusing on a very narrow plane, okay? The lower the f-stop, which is going to increase the opening on your aperture, is going to make that focus zone pretty small, like on, on like a 1.2. If you can get access to a camera that has a lens who shoots on an f-stop of 1.2, that's a good lens. That's a great lens, okay? Very few camera lenses have an aperture like that, right? Um, that you, you may be able to, you know, if you were to put the, the nose of, your, of your, char your character in focus, their ear would probably be out of focus. That's how shallow the depth of field is, right? So if you put your, your focus plane on that door, at 1.2, you know, this part of the arm down here for your chicken may be in focus, but this arm may be blurred out. So it's kind of a, it's a range, it's a distance, okay? And as we increase that number, as number, as we close down the iris, that, that zone increases, increases. So if we were to go to like an f-stop of like 20, now the entire scene would be in focus, right? So the, the aperture, the size of the aperture has a direct impact on how big or how small that little zone is gonna be. Let's put it into practice here a little bit. Let's, uh, so, let's put that little dot way back here, there we go, hit F8, yeah, check out, now the door is in focus, chicken is not in focus, and F stop of 1.2, um, which is kind of fun, let's continue to go back and kind of massage our F stop a little bit, let's start increasing that focal plane, let's put it at 4, yeah, look, now our chicken is just barely blurred, but it is out of focus a little bit, okay? If we were to do like an f-stop of 9, yep, now we're getting there, and let's just do like an f-stop of 20. Now everything is tack sharp, okay? A lot of, um, a lot of environment shots are done at pretty, pretty high f-stops. So if you take a picture of an environment, of a mountainside, it's going to be at like F9, F11, uh, where almost everything is in focus, right? Um, that same shot at F1.2, you know, like the blade of grass right in front of the camera would be in focus. Everything else would just be a blurred glob of color, right? All right. So uh, these, these are things that we have to manage, okay? And we should manage. These, these, are, these are helpful things. However, like I said, make your scene much, much bigger than this, okay? Look how close this actor is to that wall over here in the background, okay? That's going to limit our functionality, our ability to make some really good shots, right? You're going to feel constricted, okay, in these small spaces. You want big, wide open spaces so we can put our cameras everywhere and then capture a good background. Believe it or not, the cool thing about our art form isn't so much the, the framing of our focal point, our actors, is the framing of the background, okay? That's why this is, that's where the challenge really comes into play. It's managing these backgrounds and understanding what's being captured by the camera lens itself. We just can't put our cameras anywhere we want and expect uh, to produce a pretty good picture. We have to be mindful of how all these elements kind of converge and work together to craft the shot that you see in front of us. All right, I'm gonna hit undo a couple stages, get my, my environment back where it was. Looking pretty good, okay. So, uh, we need a really big set to work in. We also need to be mindful of the components of that set. It's our job as the author of the scene to ensure that we're creating pretty pictures, okay? So I got a couple doors back here, and you're probably wondering why I picked those doors. Okay, so this right here is a really bad shot, okay? If you look at the, at the, uh, the chicken itself, it's good framing, it's offset to the right. We're creating some visual tension by having a tremendous negative space uh, on the screen left side of the frame. But why is this a bad shot? Yeah, that door is kind of like a tumor on his head. Okay, it's sticking out the front, it's grabbing my attention. Subconsciously I'm going, is there something that's gonna come out of that door, right? Uh, we, we wanna make sure that the, the, the objects that are penetrating into the interior of our, of our actors, don't distract from our actors, right? The solution to this problem is really easy, right? 
And this is something that we have to be mindful of. Okay, we can either rotate the camera ever so slightly to get that door out of there. Okay, or just translate them forward, translate them back. The rotation is going to give us the solution that we all, that we want. And now, now we're now we're, now we have something that's 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 workable. Okay. So we don't want weird growths coming out of, the, of our actors' heads and, and what have you. It's going to distract them. Okay? In addition, since we're talking about camera placement, uh, how our camera is capturing our, our actor leads us very directly into understanding the emotional uh, moment that we're capturing. Okay? Let's do this. Okay. Take a picture. So what I've done here is that I've moved my camera to capture pretty much the side profile of our of our chicken. Okay, even got some depth of field in there still. I forgot to turn that off, but oh well, it's rendering fast, which is pretty great. Uh, now, how does this shot make you feel about the chicken? How does it make you feel about this the scene itself? Flat. It's pretty flat, right? It's pretty flat. If you look carefully, the profile of our character's head. It's parallel to the background, okay? It's a whole series of lines that are going from left to right. There's very little information inside of the frame that suggests to our audience that this is a three-dimensional space, that there's a foreground, a middle ground, and a background, okay? Right now, the only thing that says background is the blurred background. But if I was to take off that depth of field, our understanding of, uh, of the scene would change very instantaneously. Let's just do it real fast. Let's turn off depth of field and render one more time. Luckily now we'll render pretty fast, which is pretty good. Yeah, now it feels like that door is right up next to their chicken's head, right? It's, this is now turned into a pretty ugly picture, okay? That's going to stop our audience from understanding the film, okay? So we're trying to infuse depth in every single shot that we create. And this is the big challenge of cinematography and the creation of uh, three-dimensional scenes, okay? The solutions are really easy. It's so easy it's hard in a lot of situations. In order to create depth, we don't want parallel lines. We don't, we don't want lines that are parallel or perpendicular to the frame, uh, to the profile uh, shape of our actor. What do we want? Parallel and perpendicular lines, boo, no bueno. We want diagonal lines, okay? We want lines that run from corner to corner, okay? Check it out. Simply rotating the camera like this. Oh, look how much, how much better that shot is, okay? Yeah, now we're talking, okay? Oops, let me get my cursor out of here. Yeah, and specifically I'm talking about the planes in the background too. If you look at this wall here, see the, the intersection of the ground and the wall? We have this wonderful diagonal line. Okay, it's running from one corner, not directly to the other corner, but it's definitely moving in a diagonal line. It's not completely parallel to the bottom of our frame. Now what we're suggesting over here on the screen left side, that this area is in the foreground, the chicken, and kind of you know, this area, the walls and the middle ground, then way out over here, this is the background of our scene. Now we've created an image that just contains a tremendous amount of depth, okay? And it's far more pleasing to the eye than what we had before. Let's just take another picture real fast. And we'll compare and contrast the two. Very similar in scope and function, but that small little shift in the camera's placement in the scene just creates so much more depth, okay? We're trying to resolve flatness as much as we can. Filmmaking is, is an illusion. It's an illusion of time and space and depth, okay? So if we look at this and we compare it to what we had a second ago, very flat, not very interesting. Now we're talking. In addition, by rotating our cameras and creating these wonderful diagonal, diagonal vectors with inside the scene, we're also showing more of a three-quarters perspective of our actor as well, our little chicken. We're seeing more of this chicken's face. We're even, you know, if you think about it, you know, we have you know, foreground, a middle ground, and a background inside the face of the chicken itself. It's a three-dimensional image. 
it's kind of a weird trip for us as 3D artists to think that you know, using these wonderful 3D animation tools that it's very easy to create two-dimensional images, right? It almost, it almost feels like it should be a freebie. Oh, we're in a 3D animation. Everything should be, have depth. Well, that's not the case, right? Okay, we have to look at our artwork through these really critical lenses to ensure that what we're creating honestly works, okay? So try your hardest to avoid that as much as you can, okay? Yay. Boo. Okay. All right. We like depth. Diagonal lines are a good thing to help. All right. So let's start crafting a small little scene, a conversation between our hippopotamus and our chicken. What are they going to say? What are they going to talk about? I have no idea. <laughs> say again? Talking they're talking about frogs. I like it. They're talking about frogs, how it's raining frogs, how their how they're friend... Uh, Freddy the Frog is just, you know, he's a mean guy, okay? He's not very polite. I like that. The chicken is asking the hippopotamus if frogs taste like chicken. I like that. That's a good, that's a good conversation to have, okay? Oh, yeah. All right. So here's the challenge that we have to that we have to kind of resolve in our little camera blocking is uh, how can we have a conversation between these two fellers? Okay, how can we talk about the frog? Where are we going to place our cameras, and how are we going to stage a scene that allows us to walk through this conversation very directly? Well, the first thing that we need to do is that we need to start creating more cameras. You're never going to create your entire animatic with one mega camera shot. Okay. It's not going to work. Trust me when I say this. It's going to be 10,000 times harder, okay, than if we just had a whole series of separate cameras that we can cut, you know, in, uh, in After Effects or Premiere Pro. To a certain degree, we can do that kind of intercutting here instead of Moto, okay? So let's start adding some new cameras into the mix here. Um, now, I'm really, really crushing on, uh, let's see, I got a 200 millimeter lens. Yeah, that's pretty good for my little chicken. Um, so I'm going to duplicate this camera. Here, let's start naming this. So this is going to be, yes, this is going to be my chicken, chicken cam. And I want to put CU for close up. Some good common terminology uh, that you see out there in the cinematography world. CU is close up. Um, ECU is extreme close up, and we'll go into that here in a minute. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, this is going to be Hippo, Hippocam CU. All right. And now I want to make sure I'm doing a couple things here. First and foremost, let's look at Hippocam. Okay. So now we're looking through its viewfinder and let's spin it around and look at the Hippo's face. He looks like a demon. He's hungry, right? He's like, oh, I hate those frogs. They do not taste like chickens. Okay. All right. And this also shows quite wonderfully what we had to add into our set to make it work. Because I don't want this, I want to have a background in there. Excuse me. And it doesn't even have to be a set that works. There we go. Seriously, I mean, this is just an illusion. It doesn't have to be anything magical. Let's turn off the wireframes on this, on this viewport. No, I'm not going to make him black. Because he's, he's up, upset. Okay. So as I go through this, can you see that I'm just trying to explore what my camera's picking up? I'm trying to get the eyeballs kind of right in the middle of, or right at the intersection of that third point in here, okay? I don't care so much about the mouth. You can have parts of your character go outside the frame. That's okay. Our audience is going to understand it, right? But the eyeballs are something that we should draw focus to. We should always be trying to get them to the top third or the bottom third of our frame itself, okay? If you go back to GCOM 400, we spent a lot of time talking about the golden section or the golden mean. I'm practicing that idea 
uh, very, very, very closely uh, here in this shot. Now, I really hate, this is good composition, but I really hate this line running down right in here. This is ugly. U-G-L, why? You ain't got no alibi, you ugly. You ugly. Okay, so I want to fix it. And this is part of the... <laughs> uh, so this is part of the cool thing about working in computer graphics is that when we create a problem, we also have the ability very quickly in the power uh, to fix it. So I'm going to just move some walls around, which is kind of nice. I'm just going to move that wall. And in actuality, I think I'm going to do it in edges so I can grab all the members of the problem. Here we go. Let's see. Problem solved. Okay. I just didn't want the growth coming out of his head. It looks weird. It looks kind of ugly. By moving that wall around, it gave me a lot of flexibility and freedom. Okay. So now what we're starting to craft here is a small little scene uh, with a whole series of cameras. But there's a very important rule that we need to follow in order to maintain what's called screen direction. Okay. And this is a kind of a, a rule that we have to live and breathe by. It's called the 180 degree rule. Okay. Um, you were, I want, did anyone wonder, did anyone have a, it's curious why I was drawing that center line down our scene. You want to see that earlier? I was slicing up the scene. There is no function for that edge, right? There's actually a function is to illustrate this 180 degree line. Okay. So if you look very carefully, my two actors are sitting on that edge. Okay. If you were to break this entire scene, and I'm going to look at it from the top here. If you were to break this entire scene into a radian circle, okay? Just imagine superimpose a circle cruising on the top of this of, the, of where our actors are standing, right? We're going to subdivide that circle right down the middle, okay? And create two very direct hemispheres, okay? Let's just do it. This, this is a great way to kind of illustrate this idea. Huh? There you go, right? <laughs> Maybe that should be the focus of this, right? Sumo wrestlers, sumo wrestling chickens and, and hippos. Okay, so here's our circle, okay? Now I've drawn a center line right down the middle of that circle. There it is, okay? The 180 degree rule is as, is as such, okay? We need to pick a side for our cameras to be on, right? We can't put cameras on both sides of a circle. We have to pick a hemisphere, okay? Doesn't matter which hemisphere we pick, we just gotta pick one. And then we have to stay on that side of the hemisphere for the remainder of the scene, okay? So I'm gonna pick this side, mostly because my cameras are already there, okay? Um, so I cannot put my cameras over here. And let me show you why, okay? So we have to have a line going down our scene that breaks it into two hemispheres, and we're only gonna put our cameras on one side or the other. This is a decision that you have to make. I've made, this is my decision on the, the right side, so I'm gonna delete this left one, okay? Okay, so all of my cameras are gonna go on this side of my, uh, of my scene, and I've already started to establish that. Now, what this allows us to do, and bear with me just for one second here, Okay, so the top on the right there, that's my hippo cam. The bottom, this is my chicken cam, okay? If you look closely over inside of my 3D viewport, you can see where I've placed, placed my cameras. They're on, that, on, that, that, on that, that, that same hemispheric side over here, right? And they're shooting diagonally across the scene itself. Now, at the moment, it looks, and maybe I'm going to massage this a little bit, okay? I'm going somewhere. Um, let's do this. I got an idea. OK. Oops. There we go. Hippo. Chicken. There we go. Oops. 
There we go. All right. So now look at the top there. Hippo and chicken. Okay. This is called screen direction. Okay. The hippo is pointing. He's looking at the chicken, right? Okay. Chicken's looking at the hippo. If we were just if we were to, to just take and look at this picture, it suggests by just the, the placement and the staging of our characters within the three-dimensional scene that they're having a conversation with each other, right? So the hippo is in fact looking at the chicken and vice versa. We can put our cameras anywhere we want inside of this in this hemisphere and maintain this ever important screen direction. They both look like they're having a conversation to each other. But the moment we put a camera on the opposite side of that 180 degree line, the hippo is no longer going to be looking at, at the chicken. Okay? So let me grab the hippo cam for a second. And I'm simply going to move it. Now on the opposite side of our hemisphere, very similar composition, right? But now we've broken the screen direction. The hippo is never, ever, ever going to appear as though he's talking, at, talking to the chicken, even though spatially, with inside of our three-dimensional scene, check it out. The hippo is facing the chicken at the moment. They're talking to each other, but the placement of our cameras is, is, is completely occluding our audience's understanding of, uh, uh, of, of their kind of geometry inside the scene, their placement with inside this three-dimensional scene. This is why we follow very, very directly this 180 degree rule. So we can place our cameras wherever we want on one side, on one hemisphere, and always maintain the correct spatial understanding of, of our actors' kind of geometry to each other. Okay? Allows us to very quickly maintain this screen direction. Okay, let me hit undo, get my hippo cam back where it was. One more time, there it is. And life is good. Ta da! Starting to work. Okay? Um, Let's add a third camera into the mix here, very, very carefully, and I think you're going to see the magic of how all this works together once this third cam is in play. Now, I'm going to just create another camera. There we go. And I'm going to call this camera, uh, I'm going to call this camera the master shot. Does anyone know what the master shot's function is? Yeah, it's the establishing shot, okay? It's the whole purpose of the master shot is to very quickly establish the location and the actors inside of that location. The spatial geometry, the staging of all of these parts and pieces inside, uh, inside, of our, inside of our scene itself, okay? Now, based off of the 180 degree rule, where am I gonna place this camera? Where should I be pointing it? In the middle, facing which way? Inside the context of my screen here. Yeah, so we're so we're gonna face the camera this way. So it's pointing this way. Okay. That way we maintain our 180 degree rule. I'm just gonna spin it around. So something like this, perhaps. All right, here's our master shot. Ta-da! Okay. There we go. Let's turn on. I forgot I hid my environment. Not my first rodeo, as they say. So that's a good master shot. The master shots are really, it's an opportunity for us to describe the totality of the scene itself. But look at the camera placement. It's still on that same side of the hemisphere, right? If you look at the, at the way this entire sequence has been constructed, if this was the first shot, and often the master shot is the first composition that we see in the film, right? Because it very quickly tells the audience who we're dealing with, it very quickly places the audience in the environment, okay? And it allows us to start having our conversation about our evil devil frogs, okay? So look where the chicken is. He's on the right side of the screen. Hippo's on the left side of the screen. 
in the chicken's close-up shot. Where is he looking? He's looking to the left. Who's on the left? The hippo. Where's the hippo looking? To the right. Who's on the right? The chicken. We've established very quick, correctly, or very quickly, the correct screen direction of all the actors instead of our scene itself. Okay. This is going to cut together quite wonderfully. Okay. It's going to be a breeze to cut and intercut between all these, all these different shots because they work together as a unit. The camera placement has a direct influence on our audience's understanding or just ability to understand the narrative. Okay. So this 180 degree rule is critical. Okay. Make sense? This is something that I'm hoping that you guys start to incorporate inside of your animatic. Okay. The camera placement is crucial and it's something that's, that doesn't take a lot of energy. We've got to consider it. Okay. The cameras are as much of a player in our animations as the characters movements themselves. Okay. I'll tell you what, let's take a, a small like maybe five minute break. We'll come back in and we'll talk about moving cameras and jump cuts. Okay. Let's take a small little break. Mm-hmm.
All right, let's get back to it. All right, so, uh, oh, a couple things that I want to show you guys, okay? Come back in, everybody. Everyone has different interpretations as what 10 minutes is going to be. I'm convinced that if I said a 10 minute break, you guys would be out there for hours if I didn't start classes, right? Okay, so um, we've been going over some camera placement, but now I want to start talking about camera movement a little bit. Because how we move our cameras needs to be engineered, okay? I think the biggest source of inspiration that I draw from when I'm choosing to move my camera is Hollywood, in all honesty, okay? I try to make sure that I'm replicating an actual camera system that can be found out there in the real world, okay? Our cameras move very predictably. and We should try to, uh, you know, as closely, you know, replicate that sense as, as closely as we can, okay? That was not a good sentence, but I think you understand it, okay? Um, what we're trying to avoid when we're moving our cameras around are really extreme motions. Why? No, seriously, and that is it, right? People start to feel a little queasy, a little uncomfortable when the camera's all around, herking and jerking and just kind of everywhere, right? We want to make our camera movements slow, predictable, and forecasted, okay? For example, when I say forecasted, it's we go from here, and then we start to move the camera, and then it's very clear the plane of movement that that, that camera move is going to happen on. We're just doing this. We're doing a very simple tilt. Okay, simple camera movements, okay? Camera movements that our audience can consume and understand through the movement itself. If we're all over the place, if we're super erratic, and we're taking this camera on a roller coaster ride, our audience is gonna go click, and they're gonna tune out, okay? They're gonna change the channel, and then we've lost them forever, okay? Uh, we wanna make sure that we're leading our audience from point A to point B, okay? Imagine you're on set somewhere, if you're on a big Hollywood set shooting Star Wars Episode Nine, which they're doing right now, yeah, anyways, yeah. <laughs> um, if you're on set somewhere, what would those camera systems look like? How do they move the cameras on these big Hollywood productions? With the thing, with jigs, yeah. With the crane thing, which is called a jib, okay? A giant jib, yep. And that's how they get those epic big crane shots, right? But at the base of that epic crane, okay, what do you see? Does anyone know? Wheels, Wheels oh, oh, tracks. and tracks, okay? It's, in every sense, it's kind of like a little railroad system, right? And those wheels and that track system is gonna allow us to dolly and track our cameras around inside of our scene. The camera movements are actually very, very, very simple, okay? A lot of left to right, sometimes some nice little curves in there, but they're ridiculously simple, okay? Uh, we want to try to make our camera, cameras move as simply as we can as well, okay? So here's some strategies on helping us move the cameras simply. And trust me when I say this, don't get all Michael Bay, okay? Uh, we want to try to avoid that as much as we can. That aesthetic works to a degree. But the good place to begin, especially as you, if you're crafting an animation or a film that's going to go on your portfolio, you want to be extraordinarily conservative with your camera movements, okay? You don't have to move the camera all that much to add a little bit of uh, um, a little bit of dynamicism inside of the scene itself. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm gonna work with this camera down here. Okay, my master shot because this is a good place to begin. Because I think what I want to do here is just add a little bit of visual interest. The master shot, especially when our objects inside the frame are pretty static, is a great opportunity for us to move the camera. Remember, this is a movement-based art form, so we won't always want to have something moving inside the scene itself, okay? Something's going to move. It's either the actors or the camera, okay? Now, my master shot in the lower right-hand corner, there's nothing moving, so this is a great opportunity for us to start moving the camera around. Now, in Moto, moving the camera, of course, we're going to be translating and rotating it, but I want to create these nice, big, sweeping arcs, okay? This is maybe the master shot that I want to have. Just a simple, a simple crane shot, okay? It's not really a tilt. We're actually moving the camera here. So this would be a pan and tilt where the camera doesn't move, okay? So this is a pan where the camera stays stationary and moves left and right. This is a tilt 
again, where the camera is stationary, but then just goes up and down. This is like a jib or crane shot where the camera is physically moving inside the scene. This could be a dolly shot where it goes in and out. So let's start moving our camera and rotating our camera. Okay, so we want to make sure that we're always moving our camera in arcs. Okay, let me, just, let me show you how we can set this up. Of course, naturally, if I was to grab my camera, and this is my master camera right here, hit the Y key, you know, I really don't, uh, it's, all, it's all local control. I can rotate and I can move the camera like this, but this gets really sloppy very quickly. So the path to success when it comes to working with cameras and making these big, epic, smooth arcs is to create a simple camera rig, okay? And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to create a locator and then parent my camera to that locator. And then I'm simply going to rotate that locator. And the distance the camera is from the locator defines the movement arc. Let me show you specifically what I'm talking about. It's pretty neat, okay? So uh, I'm going to do this. I'm actually going to reset all of my transformations for my master camera. So reset all. So now it's right smack dab down there at the, the middle of our scene. Okay. And now inside of our setup tools, I'm going to add a locator. Okay. And there it is. It's just sitting at the exact same location as our camera. Let's give this locator a name. Let's call this master cam controller. Okay. And simply, oh, I'm in the shader tree. Let's go in the item list. Here's our master shot. I want to parent this object, bloop, to that guy right there. Okay, simple parent shot of relationship. And now, if I was to grab the locator and simply move it around, you can see that it's having an influence on its child. Well, let's go ahead and place the the the, uh, the target, the locator, kind of right in the middle of where I want this action to take place. So think of it like this. I've created a pivot point. Now, I don't, have, uh, I don't have the locator selected. What I have is the camera selected, and I'm going to move it back. See how the locator stays right there? Now, I'm going to get the composition that I'm after here. Something, yeah, I think it was something right around there. I'm going to move, I'm recomposing the shot now. There we go. Okay. So I moved my locator left and right. And it also moves the camera left and right. But check it out. And this is why I did all this. Uh, and this is a very simple camera rig. Because now I can just simply rotate the locator. And look at the big sweeping arc that I'm creating on the camera. We've distilled the very complex camera movement down into the movement of a very simple locator, locator rotating. Okay? So creating simple camera rigs like, rigs like this is extraordinarily helpful. Okay? Um, we want to have big sweeping arcs for all of our camera movements or very small movements, okay? Making a rig like this is going to help. So now I'm just going to go in and start keyframing maybe a simple, small little rotation here. Okay, so let's just do it. I'm going to rotate this thing uh, along which axes? The x-axis? Yep, x. So let's just key that in. And I need my timeline. So let's go into the animation window real fast. And over the course of, oh, I don't know, 60 frames or so, let's, uh, let's rotate this thing down. Somewhere right around. Let's, let's go further. Let's, let's put the camera on the ground, which is always fun. Something like that. There we go. So there's my camera shot. Slow, nice little arc. Actually, that's pretty fast. Move the keyframes out a little bit. Let's take it all the way up to 90. See what we get. Play it back again. Yeah, that's pretty good for a master shot. Okay. Now, there's nothing that says that we can't move and rotate our cameras at the exact same time. You absolutely can do that. I recommend that as much as you can, right? I'm going to do a little bit of a push in on that same locator. So now I'm physically going to move that locator inside the scene itself. Okay. So I'm going to move it back along the x-axis. So on frame 0 here, I'll just key in on x. I'm going to push it in a little bit. Let's see what that gives us. Yeah. 
and just gets it a little closer. It's subtle, okay? And that's the idea. We want to make sure that our camera movements don't distract our audience from the actual conversation between our chicken and our hippo, right? The audience should at no time be going, whoa, this is an epic camera move, right? Because that's mission failure for us. We want them to be looking at the contents of the frame, not the movement of the camera, okay? However, there is a relationship there as well. Because what the camera moves or what the camera does is going to have an influence on what our audience sees. So we need to be strategic with it. Hide it. Minimize the camera movements as much as you can and be conservative, and they'll never be attention grabbing. Okay? So small little camera movements are encouraged, but don't go crazy with it. Okay? Let me show you something that uh, something that a lot of folks do. And uh, this is kind of crazy, okay? Uh, uh, and it's jump cuts within a camera movement itself, okay? So let's talk about jump cuts. Uh, from our previous conversation, boy, this is a couple months ago now, what is a jump cut? Yeah? Go from one scene to another? Kinda, a little bit, okay? Now, we're have, we're, well, I'm gonna craft a jump cut in this very scene, okay? Uh, so it doesn't have to go from one scene to another, it's just from one shot to the next shot, all right? Now, a jump cut, is something that we're always striving to avoid. A jump cut is when we have two shots that are within a very, within a very small margin of similarity to each other, right? It's like they're, they, they look kind of the same, but they're not the same. Sometimes you have to see a jump cut to know that it's there, okay? Let's craft, I'm gonna create another camera here, and uh, let's make a jump cut. So this is gonna be jump cut. All right, let's look through the jump cut cam and let's start crafting a shot here. All right, so my chicken cam has a composition that's not too dissimilar to this, right? So this would be a jump cut. Okay. Yeah, something, something like this where we have changed the perspective a little bit, but if you were to ignore the hippo, just for, here, let's do this. Let's just reorganize this. This will be jump cut. This will be hippo. There we go. So if you look at these two shots, these are classic jump cuts from one another. Okay. These are, this is a classic jump cut. See how they're similar, but they are different, right? It's not going to cut together very well. Let me show. Let's put it into. Let's put it on the actual timeline itself. We did this uh, a while ago. Well, let's uh, let's do it one more time. Let's go in and change this. Change my viewport to not look at a specific cam, but to look at the render camera property. Okay. Now the render camera property is set. Um, the render camera property is set on the shader tree. So under the render item, this allows us to do that interactive television switching that we talked about way back in the Alien Invasion. Do you guys remember that? Okay. It's a great way for us to very quickly um, go in and establish a narrative. So let's just go to frame 30 here. And now I'm going to change my shot to my jump cut. And I'll go to frame 60 and I'll change it back to uh, chicken cam. Okay. All right. Let's play it now. So there's my chicken cam. See how it's jumpy? Okay. It's similar, but it's not different enough to make the cut between these two shots work, right? We want to try to avoid this. When we're changing the shots, okay, they need to be a drastic change in composition, right? We have, there has to be some sort of function that this, sh that this cut uh, is, is getting to, right? So instead of going to this one, let's go back and let's take, let's go to the master shot. Okay, so now we're going from chicken to master shot, back to the chicken. Okay, that works. The composition of, of, that, of that middle shot is different enough that it cuts in between uh, our, our close-up shots quite wonderfully, okay? 
Let's go ahead and craft a small sequence here. Now the first shot is going to be our master. And uh, maybe over here at frame 65 or so, let's give our master shot an opportunity to do its thing. Now we cut to some point. Oh, sorry. So right here, I want this one to be chicken cam. Okay. And then we'll go to hippo cam. Okay. It's a master, chicken, hippo. It makes sense, right? We've already seen the location of the chicken, the location of the hippo. And we're starting to tell a very simple story with these three shots. Now let's add in a couple other shots that will be nice little secondary shots that will help us craft, uh, I think, a little bit better of an illusion. Because right now, the cut between the master, that one, and our close-up shot is really extreme. That's an extreme change in composition. We're going from a wide shot where we're showing everything to a close-up shot of just one of our character's face. Maybe there's some sort of medium shot that we can throw in that will start to step our audience into this character's moment. Okay, And I want to introduce a really popular shot to you guys that I think is something that you'll find all over the place, and it's called the over-the-shoulder shot. Okay, So these close-up shots are really great because it brings our audience into, the, into that character's moment, into that character's story. The wide shots, these master shots, start to geometrically set the stage. Here, there's a good indication of the environment, where the actors are inside the set itself. Uh, but let's start creating some relationships some uh, spatial relationships between these different actors. And the over-the-shoulder shot just does such a wonderful job of doing that. Let's create, let's, I want to create one more shot now. And let's do it real quick. I'm back in my model layout. And let's add a camera. I'm going to call this uh, Hippo OTS for over-the-shoulder, common common acronym out there in the real world, OTS, over the shoulder, okay? As one might imagine, okay, let's get rid of jump cut. Let's kind of put this back to how I had it. This one's going to be hippo over the shoulder. As one might imagine, the over the shoulder shot is going to look like, look like this, okay? Where we start to see both actors inside the camera composition at the exact same time, okay? Um, used all over the place. And it's a great, it's a great shot to intercut between the wide and the close-up shots. Uh, it allows us to draw focus in on our, our chicken without losing sight and understanding of the role and the impact of our hippo inside the scene. This produces a little bit of a geometric problem for us, okay? And I really hate this, and I specifically have left all three of these cameras on the scene at once. I want you to pay very close attention to the eye lines of the hippo and the chicken, okay? Look at the top two shots. Where are their eyes in relationship to each other? Yeah, it's above the chicken, but they're, they're, kind, of, they're kind of even. They, and you're right. And the hippo is above the chicken, okay? But they're relatively kind of on the same plane, okay? And we do this intentionally, so it makes it look like our actors are looking at one another, okay? If I like, and maybe just to kind of illustrate this a little bit more directly, I could just translate the hippo down ever so slightly, and now the eyes are generally kind of on the same plane. But down here, look at this diagonal line that's being created by, by the, uh, the over-the-shoulder shot. Okay. Now, we have to be uh, mindful of this, because in certain situations, this is not what we want. We don't want it to appear, uh, well, let me craft the question. How does it appear the chicken is looking at the hippo in the over-the-shoulder shot at the bottom of the screen? Nervous? What makes, makes the chicken feel nervous? Yeah, he's kind of a nervous character to begin with. Those big bug eyes, the small little arms out on the side, right? You, you got it. You, absolutely. Yeah, you're nailing it, right? It makes it look like the chicken is in charge, right? He's humongous. He's towering over our poor little hippo that's been minimized purely by his eye line inside the scene itself. Now, geometrically, if we were to look at the staging of the scene, and the master shot does such a wonderful job at communicating all this to us, okay? We'd even see this here. Oops. 
Is the hippo that much smaller than the chicken? Not really, but what the camera's capturing tells us that he is, right? Hollywood, we're gonna break some stuff now. And this is something that we do all the time when crafting our shots. I want the hippo to be, I don't want the hippo to be minimized within inside the frame. I wanna move him, okay? I'm physically in this shot, I'm gonna move him up. I can do that. There's nothing that says I can't do that, right? Because this is all an illusion, right? I can't tell you how many times uh, they're called apple boxes. Apple boxes are just small little crates that you bring onto a film set. And whenever you want the eye lines to be different, you, add, you put an apple box down, you physically ask the actor to stand on top of the apple box to get the eye lines the way you want them to. It's all an illusion. This is fake. We're allowed to do this, okay? So on this particular shot, yep, I'm just gonna ask my little hippo here to stand on an apple box, okay? You don't move the camera, but you move Yeah, I don't move the camera, I move the actor. Yeah, because the camera is capturing the composition of the chicken. This is what I want, right? This is it, moving the camera would, would mess up that composition. The easy solution is just have your actor stand in a box. And now we're crafting something that looks a little bit better. No, the, the, the hippo is no longer minimized within the frame, and he looks of equal importance in relationship to the chicken. Okay? So these are the little tricks that we can play, right? I like to remind people, you're in control of this thing, right? This is your illusion. You can craft the illusion however it is that you see fit. You're allowed to change these things around. When and where this gets into trouble is that we start doing things like this. Okay, when we start moving our actors, where we have one shot where I have intentionally placed the actor in a different location, in this case just up, okay, he's fictitiously standing on an apple box here, okay, uh, where we get in trouble is that when we try to render this out as one gigantic sequence, right, because now, does my master shot work? No, my master shot no longer works, I can't intercut all these, all four of these cameras together uh, very quickly. Look at my hippo cam, broken. This is the only shot where the hippo needs to be raised like this, okay? So when it comes time to physically rendering this out and creating your animatic for your, for your project this week, I really wanna recommend that you save a whole series of different project files, okay? Your project is not one you know, foundry project file or one moto project file, it's not one LXO. It's a whole series of them, in all honesty, I put each shot in its own project file, okay? That way it's its own self-contained little package. One shot doesn't influence what I'm able to do in the next shot. They're their own little bubbles, if you will, okay? So this is when we start creating a media management system. So now I'm just gonna do a whole series of save as. Um, let's just create a very simple visual narrative here. I'm gonna go back in time a couple steps, okay? So this is gonna be, instead of doing hippo cam, let's do this, let's do, um, let's do this. This is gonna be shot, whoops, I hit return too many times. This is gonna be shot one, and then I'll put master. And then I'm gonna go to the hippo over the shoulder. This is gonna be, Shot O2. This one might imagine. Shot O3, chicken cam, CU. And of course the hippo cam is gonna be shot O4. All right. So now what this turns at what this turns into is a whole series of file save as is. Okay. So let's do save as. And we'll call this, I don't know. Hippo, oops. Hippo chicken battle. They're having a rap battle right now. Okay, I'm gonna put that in there. Rap battle. Uh, and this is gonna be shot. Oh, one. Right there on my desktop. Okay. Two. I'm just doing save as is now. Oh, three. 
0, 04. Okay, so now I have four project files that are in essence identical to each other, but they all contain different, different cameras. Here's the next step. We've created containers for all of our cameras. Now, in all honesty, to make your life a whole lot better, okay, I'm going to open them all up. I'm going to do all three of these at once, or kind of at the same session, if you will. I probably wouldn't recommend having all of them open at the same time. Uh, but, okay, so here's, let's start with shot four. I'm basically going to remove everything but shot four, which is the hippocam. So this gets removed. Okay. I only have the camera in here that I want. Okay. I'm just going to say, are you sure? Yes, I'm really sure. The jump cut goes the way. Yes to all. Master cam controller goes away. Yes, yes to all. And now, just in this one shot, I have just the shot that I want to work on. It saves your brain. It really does make it an efficient pipeline if you strip out all the cameras and have only one camera in each one of these little containers, okay? I'm all about saving and protecting my future self, okay? This is protecting and saving my three o'clock brain where I go, which shot is this and which project file? I don't, I can't remember, right? If you make it clear and easy and you set the structure at the, at the front of this, um, it, gets, it goes pretty fast, okay? It makes it a whole lot easier. So this is how I work and it works very, very well. This also allows us to work together on teams because now I can hand a file to Liam and he's going to know exactly what the shot is, right? There's only one shot that he's working on. He's, he, he's now responsible for making just that one shot work. I can give one shot to Thomas, another shot to Vince, another shot to, to Liam. Boom, we're on our way. Now we're working together as a team, okay? And we don't have to worry about how any change that Liam makes to his project file is going to influence what Vince is doing on his project file. We've separated the work out from each other. We're making it into little packages. In addition, it also allows us to render a little bit more efficiently, right? Because now, instead of having everything in one project file, I now have six or seven project files that I now can render on six or seven different machines simultaneously, okay? It really does make the conclusion of our production pipeline flow a little bit better, okay? If we set that foundation up pretty early, even in the animatic stage, the rest of our sequence gets a lot easier. Trust me, a lot a lot easier, okay? Uh, I want to kind of conclude with one thing um, that, that I think a lot of folks, um, as, I, as I see folks, and this is at all levels, it's not just you guys, um, a lot of folks miss is understanding the complete picture and how the complete picture is going to influence your decision-making process, right? It's pretty important for us to get the um, to see a, a complete draft of this thing early on so we know what to build, okay? I'm gonna show you a really great example, something that I did recently, and uh, I was, I did not follow my own suggestion, okay? And uh, it happens, okay? It happens, okay? Now on the surface, you guys are gonna go, ooh, this is cool, I'm not doing this to show off. This is the project file that I made a while ago. Um, my favorite World War II airplane is a B-17, um, and this is the model that I made. I did all the textures, did all the modeling, all the texturing. I got it done. Did this cool little animation that shows off the scene. Pretty rad. Okay. Uh, for a long, long time during the production of this of this model, and this is just really just a model, um, a model and a scene, a little set. I like making complete pictures. Okay. This was the perspective that I had, right? Whenever I did my test renders, it was always at this shot. This was the shot that I was going to make, right, in my mind. And then about 80% through the production pipeline and the creation of this asset, I said, you know what, it'd be really cool to have an animation to show like the entire plane, because there's a lot on the plane that you don't see in this, one, in this one view, right? And I wanted to make it just a simple little 10 second, uh, nice little dolly. This is what I came up with. Right? But because I didn't plan this shot from the beginning, there are some pretty big problems with this shot. It doesn't really work the way I would like it to work as a total shot itself. I didn't plan the contents of the asset to the shot. I, I flipped it around the other way, right? Uh, which is not a good place to begin in. So this is working, this is working, this is working. And then when I hit the render button, right about here, I went, oh. 
maybe I should have rendered and built a model for the inside of the plane. It's kind of difficult to see on the projector here, but you can see right down the fuselage of the plane. Uh, and the entire illusion is broken. Yeah, there's not a single thing on the inside of the plane. I don't know if you guys can see it all that well. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a gigantic window on the front. From this view, I don't really care or you don't really notice it, right? But because I didn't plan the animation first, I made a model that does not work in, in the context of the movement, right? We want to avoid this as much as we can. This is why we do the animatics. So we, we know exactly what the composition, the animation, and the camera movement is going to be. So we can build our assets and build our project to that kind of goal. Okay? So that there are literally no holes in your airplanes that completely snaps our audience away from this grand trick that we've created. Yeah. So is that why it's so important to do storyboard first? And animatics first, yeah. They kind of go hand in hand. Um, this is why I focus so much on the animatic, because it allows us to see the entire piece from kind of a macro view. We'll know exactly what it's going to be, and we'll know exactly what we need to build to complete that illusion. OK? Yeah? So for like the animatics, just for the camera movement, um, like, I'm just yeah, so camera movements are a part of it, but we're trying to visually tell a story. OK? Visually tell a story. Um, you know, whatever that story is going to be, it, it needs to be showcased in the actual animatic cell from, from front to end. And complete pictures. So try very, very hard to avoid those great backgrounds. Can we lower the frequency of expressions? Absolutely. Yep, for sure. I thought you were about to say absolutely not. Absolutely not. No. Okay. And this is not to brag, but I wanted to show you guys how this illusion can work. I don't have any of my textures with me. So it's just going to be kind of gray shaded. And I got four viewports here. This is going to be weird. Now, if you look at the final render of this, okay, and you saw it just a second ago, I actually made a small little air base, okay, with runways, a fence. I tried to make a cool three dimensional scene. However, when we start fundamentally looking at the illusion and what I've made, it didn't make all that much. It's, Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's, let's just say there's some modeling in there. Okay. there. There is some modeling in there. Okay, so I'm on the shot right now. Let me get into perspective view. Oh, it may have crashed. There's a lot. There's a lot. Yes. And I'm actually doing moto grass in here too, which is probably why it's freaking out right now. Here, let me. Turn off all of my grass stuff. It's all of this stuff in here. There we go. Yeah, so that's a good indication. Moto is choosing not to cooperate today. Um, but the scene itself is pretty basic, right? There's not a whole lot going on there. If you were to look, if you were to move the camera a millimeter left and right at the conclusion, the start and the conclusion of the animation, you would see the boundaries of my, of my environment, right? I built right out the, the boundaries of the camera's composition. I didn't add any more, didn't add any less, right? That's just a waste. Why would you build? Why would you have a model that you're not going to see, right? Why would you build an environment that you're fundamentally not going to take a picture of? Yeah, it's no, it's not liking it at the moment. It's still maybe loading it. Let's do this. Let's get out of default. Let's go into wireframe. Ah, there we go. Woohoo! Okay. So, pretty simple scene for the most part. Not a whole lot going on. Uh, the complex stuff is the background. All those are replicators, okay? This is the wheat field. These are all my trees. They're not actually trees. They're not 3D trees. They're just, there's two-dimensional planes. And I uh, texture mapped a picture of a tree onto that plane, right? Because they're way in the background. There's depth of field. You're never going to see it, right? So we don't need to waste resources with really true 3D trees. They're just literally planes, okay? 
Um, same with the wheat stalks, okay? The, it, we don't get into th real 3D geometry until the fence line, and it's kind of hard to see at the moment because these are all replicators. And then I have grass in here. These little cubes are about a quarter of the grass clumps, okay? I learned a lot about rendering grass on this assignment. This is the first one where I kind of doubled down on grass, right? So I want to figure this out. And uh, man, I don't want to do that again. Uh, that was not fun. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a pretty easy, simple set, okay? But if you look in the context of the shot, you never really see the boundaries of that set, okay? And that's the illusion that we're trying to craft here. We're not trying to create a true three-dimensional universe. It's just the fake one, which is kind of fun. It's, all, it's, it's really kind of freeing when you think about it, right? We just need to make what is, what's inside the frame work. Everything else can, is, ends on the cutting room floor, as they say. A little bit, yep. The background is a texture map, yeah, and that's about it. I didn't, you know, we got a little bit of a bounce in there from global illumination, but I'm not relying on it. Um, I'm a, and you'll hear me say this because we're gonna have an entire day on rendering towards the end of the semester. Um, I'm a big believer that we shouldn't use global illumination as our primary illumination source. We should use direct light sources, directional lights, point lights, and spotlights as much as we can. Um, and then the HDRIs and the GI system kind of fills in the, you know, in the soft spots, gives that little bit of kind of cohesion between all these, all these elements. But at the end of the day, I think in this particular scene, yeah, I got, you know, two directional lights. One is the key light that's creating the light source from this perspective. Uh, and then it got so dark on the shadow side, I added another light source in there just to kind of fill in the shadows, okay? And I did 